With us is Jasmine Uoa, uh, the political reporter for the Boston Globe, who was reporting from inside the Capitol on January 6th and just published a brilliant piece over at bostonglobe.com. Uh, the headline, I didn't think I was going to go home that day. Congressional staffers recall the lingering trauma of the January 6th attack. Jasmine, welcome to the program. Tell us about, about your, your experience on that day. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so that day I was, um, it started really early for me. I got to downtown in, in the morning and, and made my way over first to the Washington Monument to interview Trump supporters. Um, so I'd spent most of the, the, the day talking to people and I could already see how much emotion, how, how palpable the emotion and the outrage was among, among Trump supporters. Um, I walked down Pennsylvania Avenue all the way to the Capitol because so many streets were, were blocked off. And um, so down the same streets that we would see these rioters come down. And I was working in the, in the Capitol in the press gallery when, when we heard the, the crackling on the radio warning us to stay away from the windows and doors. We then got, um, we then, we then uh, spoke with a Senate uh, press gallery staffer who came over and, and said, you know, we have a plan in case the, the, the protesters, we were still calling them protesters at the time, um, breached the building. The plan is going to be that we're going to lock ourselves inside. So you either have a choice. You, we, you can stay inside with us or you can leave. You, or you, can, or you can go out, but you're not going to be able to come in and out. So, um, but it's just a hypothetical. Um, it's just in case. It's all very just in case. Mm -hmm. Uh, not moments within moments, a, a reporter uh, barges through the room and shouts, "Mike Pence has been evacuated!" And pretty soon we knew that, you know, the, pretty soon we activated this just in case plan. And so I grabbed my notebook and my pencil and I just left the room mm -hmm. and started reporting. Yeah. And and when you started reporting, where did you go? What did you see? What's your sense of what happened? As soon as I left the building, I, I tried, I tried, as soon as I left the press gallery, I tried going down the stairs and I came across this, this group, this bedraggled and lost looking group of, of rioters. And I, I, I immediately pulled out my camera and started filming and my mind immediately went um, to the El Paso shooting. I had covered the aftermath. Of, of the shooting in my hometown, which was where not, when a self-proclaimed white supremacist drove 11 hours in, on a quest to quote unquote kill Mexicans. And so I had spent a lot of time um, delving into white supremacist extremist groups. And I thought, well, this group looks lost and maybe not dangerous. Maybe this man doesn't have a gun, but what about the one behind him? And what about the one behind him? Right. And then I saw that more people were coming and more people were coming. So I ran up the stairs and tried to get shots from above. Um, but it just seemed like it wasn't going to stop. So I left. Um, I, I ran down another hall and was looking down and I could like, look. I looked down. Over, I was on the third floor. I looked. Oh, I looked down and I could see um, there's like a balcony there and you can see onto the second floor and and you can see these two doors that are that are an entrance to the capitol and you could just see a dense crowd just pushing up against the door and banging and banging and banging and you can just hear the sounds of the crowd yelling you know chanting usa 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 and it was just absolutely surreal whoa so uh, you, you write about the the trauma you, you, you know you you quote this uh, uh grow I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the entire story here in front of me, but I'm not sure exactly who that was, but who said that there is some kind of collective reflex of just not feeling super safe in your workplace. Have you, have you followed up with your colleagues and with the, the people who were there that day, how they're dealing with this? How are you dealing with it? What, you know, people, people describe post-traumatic stress disorder as, or syndrome as being when every day you wake up feeling like, hey, it's still that same day and having flashbacks and memories and things like that. Uh, to what extent is that happening? Uh, you, you, I, and I, I'm not asking you to speak, you know, about your own personal experience unless you feel comfortable doing that. But um, certainly, a lot of people are talking about this. Yeah, yeah. You know, the the day after the 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 attack, I just felt like I had woken up from this really long nightmare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it just still, still didn't feel real. And I think, um, in speaking to staffers, con you know, members of Congress, 
and my own colleagues, I, I, I get that same sense. It, it seems like, um, you know, as a Yana Congresswoman, Yana Presley told me in that article, you know, we're, we're in, in, in an article today, um, you know, she said, I, we're, we're still very much in, in that immediate, you know, the residual aftermath. Right. Um, and that's how I think it feels for, for a lot of people. Um, just, and, and I think some days, you know, what I heard from staffers was that some days, just doing the job is hard. Coming to the scene of a crime, you know, walking past windows that were once shattered, uh, on floors that were strewn with garbage. Um, that that those and 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 then also feeling that that alarm, that sense of alarm, um, whenever an emergency alert goes off or the or the complex goes into a lockdown, as it has so many times since. Yeah, you still there? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it sounded like suddenly it went silent. Um, you mentioned, in fact, that uh, in uh, Iona Presley, in, in Congresswoman Presley's office, there was a panic button. She has, she's a fairly high-profile legislator and an African-American woman, um, and therefore has been the, the target of numerous uh, racist and misogynist um, uh, threats and 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 whatnot and so they she installed panic buttons in her office which they've actually used on a couple of occasions when when people came in and were belligerent and those somehow vanished on january 6th has anybody ever figured out who took them where they went or why no no that still remains under investigation and i and actually sarah grove who you quoted she's she's her chief of staff and she's the one mm. who noticed who first noticed the panic buttons were missing. I, I just spoke with her because it had been in, reported in, in the weeks, or I believe in the days or in the weeks after that, uh, immediately after the attack, that it could have just been an operational oversight that it happened once when they switched offices. And she said, no, we, we looked into that. That's been refuted. We were all hoping that it was an honest operational mistake. That, that does not appear to be the case, and we still haven't gotten answers. And of course, she said, I understand, that, you know, there's there's so many things under investigation. There are still so many unknowns about that day. This isn't, by, you know, by, you know, one of the most important, but it is one that haunts her. Do you know if those panic buttons were the kind of things that are wired and installed by electricians that would be, you know, very, very difficult to rip out, or if they were you know, some of the more modern kind of Bluetooth things that you just stick on, uh, you know, stick under a desk with a little bit of uh, double-sided adhesive and they have a battery in them uh, that would be a whole lot easier to just grab and walk away with. Um, it sounded it sounded more like the, the former, um, mm. the way she, she described it without going into too much detail. The other thing is they couldn't go into too much detail about where they were or or what they looked like. Sure, security, I get it. Now. But it, it sounded like it was something that, you know, you could tell that it had been systematically turned off, torn wow. off. Wow. Wow. The, uh, you know, there's so many of these little things that have kind of fallen through the cracks of reporting that are, uh, I, you know, I, I frankly had forgotten about that. I mean, you know, I hadn't thought about it in months. I mean, literally not totally forgotten about it, but I hadn't thought about it in months. And, and I read it in your article in the Boston Globe today. Um, and and uh, we're talking with uh, Jasmine uh, Uyaya. Uyoa, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing, um, and uh, who's, who just wrote this brilliant piece in today's Boston Globe. I didn't think I was going to go home that day. Um, it's 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 remarkable. Jasmine, uh, just to, to wrap this up, what what lesson, what message would you want Americans who are listening to this conversation to take from your experience? Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm looking out the same window that I was looking at, one of the same windows I was looking out and seeing the, street, the, the crowds of protesters, and um, I'm, I'm re still reporting on it all day today on, on, on the aftermath. And I think one of the things that I um, want people to take away with is just to connect the dots that, that this was part of a, this was the culmination of, of far right and white supremacist extremism, that it's part of a much more dangerous strain that we've seen escalating um, for, for years now. You know, one of the first things I covered when I was a reporter at the LA Times was a, a bloody uh, scuffle between anti-white supremacists and, um, uh, and, and neo-fascists and, and white supremacy groups uh, right outside the, the Capitol in Sacramento. So hmm. I had already been exposed to this, this type of, of violence. I had seen it again in my hometown of El Paso, and I, I just hope we don't see it again.
Yeah, it, it is. Uh, are you reporting from the Capitol today? Is that what I understand? Yes, yes, I'm actually looking out one of the, so, the same windows I was looking out and, and seeing a dense crowd, and, and today it's just quiet and police and just a couple of tourists. Okay, so I, I'm assuming it's a somber day in the Capitol building. It's a somber day. I think that the, the mood is, is light and, and people are, um, are, are relieved. Yeah. Are, are relieved. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's I've made it through another day. Yeah, it's got to be a, a a difficult, an extraordinary and difficult moment. Um, Jasmine, thanks so much for dropping by, and thanks for writing this brilliant piece in the Globe.